Testing, testing, sound, one, two, three, testing.
you like me to establish quorum, Mr. Chair? Um, yes, I'm prepared to uh, open the meeting. Are we prepared to proceed? Okay. Um, um, shall I uh, proceed, Madam Clerk? Yes, please, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Good morning to everyone, and we welcome you to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Homelessness and Poverty Committee today, Thursday, April 22nd. Councilmember Mark Ridley Thomas here, and please serve as chair. Um, I'm going to turn it over to the clerk called the roll. Uh, Madam Clerk, please proceed to establish a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Council Member Riley Thomas as chair. Here. Council Member De Leon. Here. Thank you, sir. Council Member Buscaino. I, my apologies. Council Member Buscaino, I believe, is absent today. Um, Council Member Rodriguez. Council Member Raman. Here. Thank you. And back to Council Member Rodriguez. She's not with us at the moment. Um, we have three members, Mr. Chair, and a quorum. Thank you, uh, Madam Clerk. Uh, members of the committee, uh, thank you for your presence. Uh, we do anticipate the arrival of Council Member Rodriguez. Uh, as we know, um, Council Member Buscaino um, indicated that he would not be present today, owing to the fact that he um, had to attend a funeral uh, of a uh, for mentor, uh, he gives his regrets and uh, has uh, asked that we uh, factor him in where appropriate as we proceed. <clears throat> uh, members of the committee, uh, as we've discussed before, there are essentially four components of what I think uh, we might describe as a rational and comprehensive uh, homeless system. With your permission, I think uh, we generally agree that that includes four main components, uh, a prevention, prevention, interim housing, permanent housing, and finally street engagement. Um, and embedded throughout those four components uh, are the critical services that make a difference for people to have their dignity restored and the ability to thrive uh, presumably in new contexts. And so today's agenda items all pertain to those four components in one form or another. While we uh, anticipate holding item number seven for a, a full uh, discussion, I uh, thought it would be helpful to give a quick summary of the, uh, the agenda and overview. Uh, I begin as it relates to item numbers one and two they pertain to authorizing financing for uh, two deeply affordable, supportive housing, that is HHH projects, 55 apartments in a CD8 and 26 apartments in CD6. Um, then item number three is the HCID um, report that provides recommendations to invest in HHH funds toward um, innovative uh, programs such as the state's uh, Project Home Key Round 2. In other words, to buy and rehab underused properties and convert them uh, to deeply affordable housing. Items number four and five, as well as six, those items provide updates on uh, sites for proposed interim housing in. They authorize agreements to put into service uh, some 150 interim beds in Council District 15 and 146 interim beds in Council District 3. As said before item number seven, we are posing a pretty full throated uh, discussion uh, on LASA. The ins and outs and the implications of governance. And 
joining us will be Ann Oliver from the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities, who wrote the governance report, as well as Heidi Marston uh, uh, from LASA, who serves as the executive director. And then finally, item number eight, uh, members of the committee will explore sanitation and outreach standards based on lessons learned from Bradley Paxton, a pilot in the San Fernando Valley. Uh, I believe it will take all of what we're discussing, which we will describe generically as interventions and more to really advance this framework, to really advance a coherent policy perspective to uh, scale up our housing resources to prevent and address homelessness. Um, this committee, its members have advanced uh, multiple motions uh, since all of us have been on deck here to, in one form or another, deal with prevention, to deal with interim housing, to deal with uh, permanent housing, to deal with street engagement, to address uh, a whole range of issues that are relevant to the topic at hand. So we are hard at work uh, this week and momentous to uh, choose a term that is non-provocative, uh, and yet uh, the committee has a job to do. It is essentially to stay focused and to uh, move toward the coherence that I think the city and the county desperately need. Uh, we assert to uh, the committee's reflection and consideration that coordination, collaboration with the county has to be the order of the day as we seek to scale up our approach to the work in which we are engaged. Uh, with that having been said, we established that as preliminary remarks, uh, the public has a right to be heard. And to the extent that in this case, we seek guidance for the rules of the road. I ask uh, the city attorney uh, to help us in that regard, Ms. O'Neill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To the members of the public calling in, when it's your turn to speak, please state your name and which of the agenda items you would like to speak on. You will have one minute to speak on one agenda item or two minutes to speak on two or more items. In addition, those who would like to address the committee with general public comment will be provided one additional minute for a maximum of up to three minutes per person for all agenda items, including general public comment. We will inform you when your time is up. When speaking on the agenda items, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you are not speaking on topic, or we cannot tell whether you are speaking on an agenda item, you will get one brief warning from the city attorney or the chair. If you do not immediately get clearly on topic or if you stray off topic, you will forfeit the rest of your time and we will move on to the next speaker. We will take up to 40 minutes total of public comments today. Please press star nine to request to speak. As soon as you hear someone address you on the phone, please press star six and state your name and state which agenda items you would like to speak on. Thank you for your cooperation. Uh, thank you very much. Before we go to the uh, uh, clerk to read the additional instructions to call in, uh, the chair acknowledges the presence of the Honorable Monica Rodriguez, representative of the distinguished San Fernando Valley. Thank you very much for being here, and we proceed to you, Ms. Campos. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 160-431-9380 and then press pound. Press pound again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star 9 to request to speak. 
Please note, if you are listening to the meeting on a computer or speaker phone, you will need to turn down the volume on those devices before you speak. If you do not turn down the volume, there will be an echo. Again, once admitted into the meeting, press star nine to request to speak. That concludes the instructions, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Um, ready to take public comment at this point. Uh, may we have the first speaker, please. Caller with the last four numbers, 7277, please press star six to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Hi there, this is Jed Perriott. I'd like to speak on general public comment and item number eight. You have one minute for the item and one minute for general public comment. Street Watch LA and the Services Not Sweeps Coalition stands in opposition to the Paxton Bradley protocols. We stand for house keys, not handcuffs. That means permanent humane housing for everyone who wants it and against any form of criminalization and forced displacement, which Paxton Bradley includes. It includes the threat of an eviction date, a date certain where people will be forced to leave an area and forced into whatever quote unquote housing options you are all offering. This is a major issue we have where you all just say the word housing when you really mean temporary shelter or carceral shelters or tiny sheds or hotel rooms with very strict rules and once again, exit dates or eviction dates. Uh, there is no path to permanent housing guaranteed to folks here and this is the problem. We demand that you give folks a concrete path to permanent housing in writing and also give them the autonomy and agency to choose what type of housing they want. There are folks who've been on the streets for so long. They are so used to living in a tent. They're not comfortable going into a room right away with those strict carceral rules. You have to meet people where they are at. And once again, we're not only against the fact that you are using criminalization, which has proven over time again and again to be a failure and a huge waste of money. Look at safer cities in Skid Row. And this is what you're about to do again here with Judge Carter, right? The forced removal of people from public space and then the the, the privatization of space by putting fences up. This is ridiculous. You are taking away public space as a means of banishment to please your white homeowner uh, folks who are calling because they don't like that they have to see tents. This is bullshit. And it's, we're not going to let you get away with it. We're not going to let you get away with it. How is he's not handcuffs? Uh, let people have autonomy and meet them where they're at. And we are against tax Bradley because it uses criminalization and the threat of eviction as a way to force people into temporary, not permanent solutions. I yield my time. Thank you for your testimony. We'll take the next caller, please. Caller with the last four numbers ending in 5531. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Caller with the last four numbers, 5531. Hi, can you hear me Hi. now? Yes, we can. Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, I just wanted to, my name is Robert Pepe. I'm a uh, homeowner in Silver Lake and soon to be a um, uh, landlord. And I totally, oh, I wanted to speak on seven, eight, and get general public comment. You have two minutes for the items and one minute for general public comment. Okay, first on, off on item seven. We need to change the way that the board members are picked. They should be elected. When someone like Drew Pinsky, you know, a maggot, follower of Donald Trump and probably a QAnon member, can be appointed to the board by crazy Catherine Berger, something needs to be done. They should be elected to that position. Um, moving on to item eight, I totally oppose criminalizing homelessness like Mitchell Farrell did in Echo Park. We don't need fences in this city. What we need is housing, and we need public housing, social housing for all. You guys are just make criminalizing the homeless and all of the people that are soon to be evicted because of the tsunami of evictions that, that is coming shortly. And most of those people are going to be black and brown. And you know that. And you know that 50 to 100,000 people are going to be evicted in the next year from their homes 
by your landlord paymasters, and you're not going to do anything about it. What we need is social housing, public housing. We need 200,000 units of social housing and public housing, not these carceral uh, uh, bed bunks that you're going to force adults to live in. I mean, would, would Mark Ridley Thomas like to sleep in the same little tiny hut as Joe Buscianno and listen to him, his Italian fart? from all the fucking spaghetti he eats all the time? I don't think so. You know, nobody wants to sleep in the same room as Joey Bucket's feces. You know, uh, that's, me, sir. that's Pardon me, just for a moment. Just for a moment. Yes, uh, sir? Uh, you have an obligation, I believe, to stick to the point of the... Oh, I'm the sorry. Purpose. Pardon so, me. Please Mr. proceed, sir. Thomas. Please proceed. Okay. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Needless to say... This uh, item eight is just, I mean, you're not changing anything. We have new council members, you know, Nithya and Mark Ridley Thomas and Katie Leone. And you still go back to the same thing, criminalizing poor people, criminalizing black and brown people, you know. And, you know, that LAPD and the sheriff's department, they're out to enforce this shit. And I don't see any difference. May I say that your time has expired? Thank you for your... Oh, okay. Well, thank thank you you very much, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, sir. You have a good day. Bye-bye. Likewise. Bye-bye. Next speaker, please. Caller with the last four digits ending in 4320. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, my name is Julia. I'm a sustainability student at California State University, Northridge, and I just make a general public comment. You have one minute. I would like to preface my comment by saying my support for items num- numbers one and two, where the city administrative um, are making uh, two housing projects, like the 55 unit and the 26 unit one. I hope those projects will be up and funded soon, and I'm interested in a majority of the items listed. I'm pleased with the committee's efforts. However, some situations could be handled a little bit differently. For example, the Echo Park homelessness situation. It has been about a month now since that has taken place. And to my knowledge, around 180 people have been offered temporary housing. And I would like to recommend that in the future, the government were to do something like this again, maybe take precautions and measures to offer up temporary or even better permanent housing instead of forcibly removing people. With the pandemic going on, the homelessness population is under um, significant stress and you and I want them and the rest of the public protected. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you for your uh, call. We'll take the next caller, please. That was the last caller. All right. Uh, Public comment has been uh, exhausted at this point, unless there are other callers. There is one caller left. There is one caller remaining. Um, thank you very much. Uh, caller, please proceed. Caller with the last four digits ending in 2979, please press star six to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Hi, my name is Peggy Lee Kennedy, and I'm sorry, I actually uh, did hit star uh, nine, and it said I would be that. So maybe there's other people that haven't, you didn't uh, get through with. I'd like to. Um, All right, hold on, speak hold on, on, just for a second, Peggy, just a second. Uh, let the technical support uh, be absolutely sure and not others having difficulty uh, getting on. It's a bit unusual that we've had such limited speakers, so we will make sure that that's the case. All right, so start uh, Peggy's time again. From the top, Peggy, please proceed. Okay, I'd like to speak on agenda item eight and general public comment. Right. Um, with the Venice Justice... Okay, thank you. I'm with the Venice Justice Committee. And we support uh, services, not sweeps, opposition to agenda item eight. I am from Venice, and I have seen what it's like to have people displaced and uh, moved into these temporary locations and fences put up it, it, uh, with police standing over them while the city puts these fences up. And then also the people are, have, like, four or six 
social service agents like pressuring them to go into these shel- temporary shelters. I was called just Monday by somebody who is now being transferred from uh, the Penmar Golf Course, um, whatever removal, and to the, her fourth location, and she was hysterical. So you know we need permanent housing, not more shelters. That should not be the goal. Absolutely not be the goal. That's not helpful. People go in there, they leave, they become homeless again. It's not working. This and throwing the police, it has to stop throwing the police at people. It is wrong and it's trauma based. We need to take people out of these situations, not torture them and, you know, drive them around to all these places they don't really want to go. No, you know, for my general public comment, the city puts liens on all kinds of people who have code enforcement errors. And in Venice, we have 60 apartment buildings that transfer into short-term rentals illegally. What is being done about this? You know, there's so much stuff that we could do to house people soon. You know, there's empty hotels. There's these right. uh, huge code Thank violators. You. We could. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, your time has expired. We'll move to the next caller. Ms. Tilton, if you would give instructions again, that would be useful. Please press star nine if you wish to speak on public comment. Caller with the last four numbers ending in one zero zero six. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, I, I, I'm actually calling in from a second number, which didn't get, the first one didn't get called on. Um, so I, I do want to note that there might be other people who called in earlier who are experiencing problems. Um, I'd like to speak on items seven, eight, and general public comment. You have two minutes for the All right, please proceed. Thank you. For item number seven on the structure of LASA, um, you know, I, LASA has all kinds of problems, but I, it's a shame to see a whole lot of buck passing going on. Um, LASA's failures permeate from the structural failures of uh, our city and county. Um, we have excessively large districts that don't allow for the effective delivery of services. Uh, we need to expand the city council and the board of supervisors and we need an elected county executive. Um, those aren't things that are being entertained right now, but we're just kind of rearranging chairs on the deck of the Titanic unless we actually address the structural problems um, that LASA fits within. Um, for item number eight, want to join in opposition on that. Um, you know, seeing these tiny shacks being used as a weapon and a threat is just really, really disgusting. Um, for uh, general public comment, uh, I want to throw back to the last meeting. Uh, I was kind of shocked to see it here. Councilmember De Leon say that he was agnostic on the type of housing being provided by his plan for 25,000 by 2025. Um, if that's, I, I don't know if that's really a North star for addressing homelessness. It feels like more of a North star for a mayoral campaign. Um, and it's really just all in all insulting. Um, you know, if you want to move forward with something without knowing anything about what type of housing you're providing or how you'll come remotely close to delivering it, uh, frankly, Councilmember really Thomas saved your ass from embarrassment. You can bet the LA Times editorial board would have rained on your parade and dissected the empty promises you were offering, whether we're talking about the unhoused or the public at large. Um, the most important thing we could foster and the most unfortunate thing we could piss away is trust. So please um, foster that. Thank you for your time. All right, uh, next caller, please. Please press star nine if you wish to speak. Callers wishing to make public comment, please press star nine if you wish to speak. At this time, there are no additional callers requesting to speak. All right, thank you very much. I think we've done all that we can with reason uh, to accommodate whoever might wish to be heard. Uh, that effectively completes our public comment portion of the agenda for today. I want to say thank you to everyone who did call in. Now we'll turn to our agenda. 
and members, uh, your permission, uh, I'll move the following items on consent. Um, on one, two, three, four, five, six, and eight, that these items seven to be discussed by the committee. Um, and uh, Chair will entertain a second on that motion. So De Leon, I see your hand is raised. You know, I'll, I'll second the, the motion. Just uh, I wanted to pull file item number three, just for a, a quick question. Uh, if anyone from HCID is present. Hey, um, let's then dispose of um, uh, all of the items with the exception of the question that's being posed by uh, Mr. De Leon on item number three. Uh, for now, uh, those are on consent. Um, 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 I see, I see uh, council member Rodriguez, uh, ma'am. Yes, Mr. Ridley Thomas, I just wanted to be clear. We had, uh, some recommendations for the clerk to read into the record on item eight. Yes. And, uh, as we move toward uh, disposing of the item, uh, Madam Clerk, us, uh, do so with an eye toward all those uh, matters that you need to tend to technically and or not. Uh, Ms. Campos. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I also just want to note for the record that for items uh, one and two, the action um, by the committee there is to um, note and file the um, housing report and adopt uh, the recommendations in the CAO report. Um, yes. So moving along, the uh, additional instructions for item number eight um, are the following. Instruct the CLA to consolidate the recommended procedures outlined in the December 4th, 2020 BOS report and the November 19th, 2020 BOS report responsive to council file 20-1406 into a shared guidebook for a cooperative approach to housing operations for presentation to the Homeless and Poverty Committee. Upon review and approval by the committee and council, instruct BOS to adopt and implement the shared guidebook into its protocols and procedures. Instruct HCLA to incorporate the shared guidebook into the city's contracting with LASA and its contracted ser service providers. Instruct the city attorney with the support of the BOS to create a personal property waiver as an optional tool Upon the adoption of the share guidebook, Ring State Comprehensive Notice Cleanups um, Care Plus, in coordination with service providers at priority encampment locations that are part of targeted efforts for available housing resources that have been confirmed pursuant to the homeless roadmap. And that is the conclusion of the additional instructions, Mr. Chair. All right, thanks very much. Uh, members of the committee, you've heard uh, those items, as I indicated before, with the exception of item number um, uh, three, which we will revisit uh, momentarily. Madam Clerk, uh, please call the roll. Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, Aye. Thank you, sir. Council Member De Leon. Aye. Council Member Rodriguez. Aye. And Council Member Raman. Aye. Uh, we have four votes in the affirmative, and these items are approved on consent, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Let's proceed then to the questions that you have, Mr. De Leon, on item number three. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much, colleagues, uh, for the opportunity to uh, ask a very quick question. Hi, Ann. Good morning. Um, I, I've seen the recommendations put forth. And I, I do think the recommendations are, are in the step in the, in the right direction. Um, I, I want to read the recommendation number three, which is, and if I get this correctly, um, verbatim or paraphrase, um, if I do, if I get it incorrectly, please, and by all means, uh, 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 correct me. The recommendation for number, file item number three, of the five recommendations that I read here is allocation of up to $50 million of committed prop HHH balance for innovation programs and projects included, including, I should say, for the match of project home key round two, 
if state funding is available and or acquisition, rehabilitation, reuse, or new construction of innovative projects such as motel conversions or turnkey developments that will deliver interim or permanent housing within 12 to 18 months at a lower uh, per unit cost. Um, am I correct in the ballpark, uh, Anne, more or less? You're spot on, council member. Okay, thank you. So the question I have, and this is a bit very simple, and then we'll move on to the rest of the agenda, is I think you're clearly in the right direction and in, in support of, of, of this more streamlining using the dollars in a much more efficient manner uh, again to get value for for taxpayers to build as, as, as quickly as possible and that's why uh, perhaps the confusion uh, of one of the callers in terms of being agnostic whether it is home key whether it is master leasing scattered site uh, whether it's redaptive reuse you know whether it's the traditional funding of a building you know as long as we start moving quickly uh efficiently to build as, as as quickly as possible to put folks under a roof the, the only question i have and again i know that you inherited this is all of these good recommendations shouldn't we have done all of these recommendations for the whole entire pot of money you believe for hhh as opposed to a small sliver of the 50 million dollars now i know we you, you can't go back you know but shouldn't we have adopted it you think shouldn't i'm, I'm sorry let me make sure i'm the school, um, general manager housing community investment department uh let me make sure i understand your question should we have adopted it for all currently available hhh money or should we have adopted it from day one I, from day one i would say from day one well project so um i know home key wasn't with us from day one nor was room key from day one yeah you know, those two components weren't with us they are with us today but other redaptive so reuse that make home key or you know um a good deal were not with us from day one we we thought about people tried to do motel conversions in fact we have five motel conversions in the initial hhh out of 125 projects and they are not cheaper and they are not faster um in in those days you know motel owners were were getting you know one one of them described his motel as an atm to us you know like when i want money i open it and when i don't want money i close it so the prices were much higher. The pandemic created the environment where motel owners were interested in selling. It's something that that made sense for this program. So, um, so, and and frankly, the the belief that conver you know in, in, that acquisition and conversion to something else, you know, from something else, is cheaper than building new. Our experience does not bear that out. My own personal thirty year experience of being a developer, a nonprofit developer of thousands of units, does not bear that out. Um, see, that's interesting because see, we have a conflict of, of data points and, and, and I think uh, experiences because uh, I think I've had ample, you know, conversations to look at data points and financial models as well that actually contradicts what you just said. Now, it's valid from what your experience is and what you've engaged with and the price points and probably maybe some characters out there are looking to squeeze as much as they can from government because they know they, they perceive us as an ATM machine to the point that you made with regards to the motel owner. Uh, but I've also spoken with individuals who says that they can give us a price point of 100K in the conversion on, on a per unit. Of course, square footage and other amenities may be different without question, right? But I think the end goal is putting a roof over their head. Um, obviously, to your point, which regards to home key and, and, and room key, it wasn't with us at that time, right? So it had been very difficult for us to sort of make that. When I see here, reuse, acquisition, rehabilitation, in a way, it's a, it's a validation of, of points made by other council members that if we're adopting it now. Perhaps we should have adopted it years back because if it's financially efficient for us if it's not efficient then i don't know why we're doing it but if it is efficient now i think I'm, i guess the point we should have been doing this from day one and of course to underscore this is before your time and you weren't in charge of of, of hcid at the time in the development of the regulatory framework and how to 
go about, you know, spending the dollars. But I, I think that, you know, just more commentary right now as opposed to question. I, I like this is what I'm saying. And I want to underscore. I like this recommendation. It's a good recommendation. But it's a recommendation I wish we would sort of implement it as a whole uh, years before. Again, just to get with the end goal objective of just getting more units out there online, just getting more units out there live, come hell or high water, whichever way. That's why I use the word agnostic. It doesn't have to be the traditional, you know, a stick building that has to be built, you know, from day one, but whether it's readaptive reuse, whether it's acquisition. And of course, at the time, and you're right, um, there wasn't a lot of distressed physical assets in terms of motels and hotels where there was a lack of, you know, um, uh, uh, folks, you know, um, 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 renting or uh, I should say uh, uh, using hotels and motels because of pre-pandemic conditions were dramatically different than it is today. But I think we, we were on the same page on this one. That's all. Was uh, Other than that, I think that the recommendations, again, uh, are in, in the right direction. And that's why I'll also be uh, voting for this when the motion is made. I'll, I'll make the motion, Mr. Chair, uh, at your discretion. Please proceed, Mr. DeLeon. Well, I'll make the motion that uh, we pass a file item number three, whenever you like. All right. Uh, item number three is now before us. Mr. De Leon uh, has made the minister a second. Second. Okay. It's been properly moved and seconded. Mr. De Leon uh, uh, misled the chair by indicating that he wanted to ask um, a question and went on on and to a full-on dissertation on the matter at hand. Uh, the First Amendment is alive and well in the Homeless and Poverty Committee. It's the moment to reprimand and correct uh, someone from public comment. You're working your program today, Mr. De Leon. <laughs> the chair, Mr. Vice Chair, you're doing what you do. <laughs> I think the matter is uh, before us. Uh, Ms. Sewell, thank you for responding. To Mr. De Leon, he did invite the opportunity for you to correct him um, where uh, deemed appropriate. I note that you uh, didn't do so, and if it was, it was elegant, uh, a scaled down admonition, which we uh, certainly celebrate. All right, the item is before us. Uh, with that in mind, uh, please call the roll, Madam Clerk. Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, Councilmember Lee Thomas. Aye. Councilmember De Leon. Aye. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. And Councilmember Raman. Yes. Thank you. Aye. Yes, aye. Okay. Um, this item has four votes in the affirmative and is approved. All right. That uh, essentially uh, clears all consent items. Uh, it now takes us to item number seven. Um, and um, uh, Madam. Uh, clerk, would you please read the item for the record? Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, be before I do that, if, with, if it's okay with the committee and with your permission, I'd like to um, just correct for the record. Um, I think I misread one of the acronyms in, in Council Member Rodriguez's instructions, and so I would like to just uh, note that for the record, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's, it's an acronym that you misread? Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, you are forgiven. Proceed. <laughs> Thank you. It was in the second line of the first instruction uh, and the November 19th, 2020 uh, LASA report responsive to Council File 2014-06, not BOS. Um, and I just wanted to, to ensure that um, in the in the third bullet, second bullet point, rather, it was uh, instruct and or request that the city attorney, uh, with the support of, again, uh, Bureau of, of Sanitation um, create a personal property waiver as an optional tool. Thank you. Just wanted to get that right. All right. Uh, okay. It is now correct unless someone uh, objects. Um, I think we are in order. Please proceed as Chair requested, uh, Madam uh, Clerk. Thank you. Item number seven is a discussion relative to the Los Angeles Homeless Service Authority, LASA, communication dated March 3rd, 2021, regarding current structures that govern LASA's operations, policy development, and relationships with key partners across the region. Um, in addition, Mr. Chair, for the record, the presentation that um, is going to be discussed by the members has been uploaded to the council file, sir. Thank you. 
Well, thank you very much. Um, so today we have, as I indicated earlier, and Oliver visiting uh, senior fellow at the Center on Budget Policy Priorities. She'll make the presentation on her report um, uh, that was prepared for losses ad hoc committee on governance. Uh, the loss of commission has already reviewed this report. Um, and um, in addition, we will have uh, with us um, Heidi Marston, who is the executive director of LASA, and uh, LASA commissioner uh, Sarah Dussault, who chaired the ad hoc committee on governance. In the weeks to come, you'll see a series of members of the committee on governance as it relates to LASA and our deliberations. First, this report from LASA itself, uh, followed by a report on governance from the chief, chief legislative analyst. And thirdly, uh, the county's uh, report on governance. And finally, the report on system-wide governance uh, by the Committee for a Better LA, led by the Weingart Foundation. So we will have by the four, at least four bites at the apple. Why? Uh, because of the centrality of LASA as we seek to address the homeless crisis in uh, this region. Uh, in many respects, uh, LASA is um, referred to, I guess, somewhat metaphorically as the elephant in the room. Um, so today's discussion will launch a series of discussions uh, which we must have. It needs to be palms up, as candid and constructive as circumstances will allow. And I think uh, we owe it to uh, the public, we owe it to the city in its entirety, council, mayor, the city attorney, the controller, all elected officials to understand governance as it relates to homelessness. Uh, I feel very strongly about that. This committee is well positioned in terms of this composition and to uh, dig in. Uh, with that having been said, um, uh, Madam Clerk and members of the committee, uh, let's proceed with the uh, presentation, as is already indicated in the public file, council file. We'll now turn to Ann Oliva to proceed with her presentation, after which we will ask uh, a range of questions on uh, uh, the committee and beyond. Thank you very much. And if I may uh, just introduce and uh, add a little more to what you said, sir, uh, just to frame a little bit for the committee uh, under the authority of the joint powers agreement that exists between the city and the county of L.A., the LASA Commission about a year ago under the leadership of Commissioner Dusso underwent a review of governance that is called for to happen every five years or so. So to ensure that there was an independent review and an outside look at our existing structure and system, the LASA Commission hired Anna Leva, who is one of our nation's foremost experts on this work, not only in homelessness, but in governance and has undertaken um, these efforts in other communities as well. So it was the perfect candidate to look at the evaluation and the, the structure of LASA. So I'm gonna turn it over to Anne to go over her findings and her report. We'll be happy to answer questions and talk about what LASA is also doing internally to be responsive to, to Anne's findings. Thank you so much, Heidi, for having me. And um, uh, thank you to the committee for having me today. I'm excited to talk to you about, about the report. I wanna give you a little bit of context. Can folks um, see my screen? Yes, okay, uh, great. Let's just make sure that you can see that. 
the first thing I do want to note is is a couple of things about myself. Heidi introduced me. Um, I'm also the former Deputy Assistant Secretary for Special Needs at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. I wrote the regulations um, on governance for the continuum of care and uh, and the related programs. So as part of this work, I was trying to ensure that LASA as the lead agency for your continuum of care was in full compliance with its federal uh, regulations. And I also have done this work, as Heidi noted, in a number of other communities across the country. And I will say, one, I really enjoyed speaking with and uh, interviewing uh, a little over 100 people across uh, the city and the county uh, on this issue and really tried to dig into where, where you all are more complex um, than, than other communities that I've worked with. And I hope, hopefully we'll will outline that as we go forward. Well, I'm certainly um, looking forward to this presentation. Now, Ms. Oliver, you've had three introductions. Um, I gave you one, Heidi gave you one, and you gave yourself one. And so I can only say to you, this, nice, this better be a hell of a presentation because we are waiting for you to blast us off here, okay? So uh, thank you, sir. <laughs> um, <laughs> Didn't mean to set myself up in that way, but thank you. <laughs> I, I didn't um, want to let you down. Go ahead. <laughs> so as I mentioned, uh, I began interviews uh, last October and, and, conducted, and conducted interviews <laughs> through February of 2021. You can see on this slide that we tried to really cut across a number of types of interviewees including LASA senior staff, including the commission, um, local COGS, people with lived expertise and experience, a number of business leaders and faith-based organizations. I'm not gonna go through every single uh, person on this list, but I do feel like we were able to cut across um, a, a very wide variety of stakeholders. And so I conducted uh, myself 50 interviews with over a hundred people. And I just want to note, I know that John Wickham is on today. Uh, some of those interviews were conducted jointly uh, with city and county staff, including John, and some of them uh, I conducted independently. I also did a fairly significant document review as part of, uh, of, of this overall work. You can see the, the number of documents that I looked at are listed on this slide. I'm not gonna go into them again in, in great detail, but there are a, a number of complex documents that are related to losses governance that were important for us to understand as we uh, thought about what, um, what recommendations we wanted to make going forward. So while that was the process, uh, I think probably the most important part of this conversation for this group of folks is really the context and, and, and providing you with a baseline understanding of why it was so important to conduct this type of governance review for, um, for LASA. And the, the first reason is that LASA is evolving as an organization since its creation uh, through the first Joint Powers Authority from uh, a simple or more simple grants administrator for the homeless system where really money was flowing through the organization uh, and that was their primary function to really being more of a system administrator, which across the board, I heard from, from folks that uh, a system admin administrator role is incredibly important and needed within the region. However, what I also heard from many of the folks that I interviewed was that neither LASA's current governance structure nor the Joint Powers Agreement really fully support them in this role, um, in large part because its work is, is uh, often um, dictated or by the city and the county who do not delegate full responsibility for homeless services to LASA as an organization. And then the second item that really prompted this governance review is the fact that LASA has seen unprecedented growth over the last five years. Again, one of the reasons that I reintroduced myself was so that you all know that I wasn't what they were saying to me. I was taking all of that information and trying to um, 
really analyze it based on my own experience in this field over the last 25 years. And I will say that I have never seen the kind of growth that LASA has uh, undergone over the last five years, 728% increase in budget and 252% uh, increase in staff in five years is, is really unprecedented and an important reason for us to go through this process of looking at its governance to make sure that governance is growing alongside the organization. And again, here's just some information around, uh, just so you can see it visually on that budget growth and, uh, and the growth in personnel. What I would note here is that the budget growth has really outpaced the personnel growth. So LASA, even at this point, is not fully resourced to do all of the, um, all of the work that they are responsible for, for doing within the region. And here is a brief overview of LASA, um, just taking a look at the different funding sources. So you're, you can see the different funding sources on the left. Uh, federal funding is a little less than 4% of its full portfolio. The state of California funding around 15%. The county uh, provides a uh, close to 50% of the funding. The city of LA uh, provides 31.5% uh, of their funding. Of their funding. And then on the right, you can see um, because of ma major projects and direct programs, they have about 900 uh, contractual agreements across the county. Um, that is a huge, huge operation. And we're going to get to operations in just a moment. So as we uh, as, as I conducted these interviews and thought about the challenges that folks were raising, what really came across most um, sort of definitively was that this really needs to be a three-step process uh, in terms of creating the structure that we need to reach the goal of, of ending homelessness in Los Angeles. And step one, as you can see in this slide, is really about organizational capacity and functionality um, in order to make sure that operations are as strong as possible. I'll get into some detail in just a moment, but even though I was asking these hundred plus people that I interviewed about operation, about governance, most often uh, what I got back was um, concerns or challenges that were being experienced around operations. And I had to sort of constantly bring the conversation back to, uh, to a governance uh, conversation. So operations matter, but so does uh, LASA's ability to carry out its identified role. So we want to make sure that uh, the LASA governance is structured to support those operations and the vision of the organization. So that was really my role in this process. But what also came across from all of these interviews and from my own experience working here and in other areas of the country and even at the federal level is that in order for LASA to be successful, you actually have to have a really strong regional system in place uh, to develop regional goals um, and really like set the agenda for, for everybody to be following. And that's not in place at this time. Um, so that is something that, that is one of the recommendations that, that uh, is reflected in the report, that we really need one more step. There are things that LASA can control, but there are many things, as uh, several folks have noted, that LASA uh, does not control or that are outside LASA's span of control. So next, I'm going to touch on uh, the themes that we saw across all of the interviews that were conducted. And you can really break down those, uh, those 50 interviews um, into four broad areas. The, the themes that came across were really in four broad areas. I've already touched on um, operations. Re almost in every case, almost in every interview, uh, at some point, the interviewee touched on a challenge or a concern around LASA's operations um, and really made it clear that in order for LASA to be successful to, to address all of the challenges and to gain community trust, uh, operations have to be tightened up and really uh, be successful. 
The second general theme that came across was around role clarity. Many interviewees didn't really understand or saw overlapping or unclear lines of authority. There are a lot of governing bodies that are related to LASA. For example, there is the Continuum of Care Board. There is um, the RAC, um, the Regional Homelessness Assistance Council. <laughs> I think I got that wrong, but- uh, Advisory Council. Advisory Council, thank you. Um, there are a number of these governing bodies that relate to um, that relate to LASA, but it is unclear who gets to make decisions in what contexts. And a lot of, of folks um, found this very confusing. Um, the, the third broad item uh, was really support for system administration. And this was really about uh, LASA's ability to carry out the system admi administrator function. Most interviewees do not think that LASA has the independence or political support necessary to really successfully carry out that role, even though they want LASA to carry out that role. And I think it's important to note here that across the board, many interviewees uh, noted that LASA's job is incredibly difficult and that LASA is often blamed for challenges that are really outside of its own span of control. And then the last item that was a general theme in these interviews is really about the system-wide vision and goals that I mentioned as part of uh, step three of that graphic that I showed a couple of slides ago. This lack of regional goals or metrics or a common vision uh, was raised in numerous, numerous interviews. And folks expressed that this clear lack of direction really sort of contributes to um, LASA being caught specifically between the city and county uh, when there are disagreements around policy or funding priorities. I wanna note as well that partnering with people with lived expertise uh, came up a number of times, not just from people with lived expertise who I interviewed. Um, it came up uh, across the board as something that folks wanted to see more of uh, within LASA's governance structure. So one, making sure that, that any governance changes that we're making as a result of this report or other reports uh, adhere to a racial justice and equity approach and that lived expertise is included in uh, any governance structure changes that we're making. Uh, we want to make sure that we're aligning to the principles and recommendations made by the Ad Hoc Committee on Black People Experiencing Homelessness. And in the full report, you will see that, that I noted in a number of places where there is alignment between uh, these recommendations and recommendations from that report. And that we want to have sort of authentic representation in all governance bodies by people with lived expertise, not just sort of token representation in one place. So I'm going to move to a summary of uh, the recommendations that were made in, uh, in the report. And they are very reflective of all of the items that I just noted. The first and probably uh, the, the one that actually has to happen the quickest uh, and that is already well underway that I believe that Heidi um, can speak to in more depth is really this completing the implementation of LASA's strategic plan that has been um, underway for the last about 18 months and really strengthen operations in the areas of contract and payment um, communications, equity, practice, equity practices, and really talking um, with and creating a direct connection with sub-regional leaders. So, this process will go a long way into creating and building the trust that LASA needs within uh, the region in order to uh, be successful in its work as a system administrator. But that can't be all. LASA also has to establish role clarity. Um, as I noted, there are a number of uh, bodies that are related to, uh, to LASA's operations, uh, including here the LASA Commission, the Continuum of Care Board, uh, the Coordinated Entry System Policy Council, 
the Lived Experience Advisory Board, and the Regional Homelessness Advisory Council, the RAC. Um, so uh, while those first several really need to work on um, clarifying where they have decision-making authority when they're acting in an advisory capacity and uh, when they're just making recommendations on very specific policy or program areas, I actually recommended that uh, the RAC, the Regional Homelessness Advisory Council, be, dis be dissolved after a process to make sure that it's being done well. Um, in part because RAC members actually were not quite sure why they were meeting. And, um, and we wanna make sure that every single body that's related to LASA has a strategic purpose and helps it move its mission uh, and vision forward. And then also uh, in terms of role clarity, just ensuring there are many, many work groups very often city related, county related, LASA related, continuum of care related that are working on similar items. So as part of this process, really doing a full analysis of those work groups um, and combining them where they need to be combined, dissolving uh, work groups that no longer need to be in place. And again, ensuring that um, the right people are on the right work groups and that each work group has a strategic uh, reason for existing. In terms of the LASA Commission itself, um, we made some recommendations uh, there as well. The role of the, the, the Commission itself and its members um, really can be quite immediately clarified and changes can be made to make the Commission stronger while some other work is being done uh, that you noted, um, Council Member Ridley Thomas. Uh, the first is to really create position descriptions and some expectations for LASA commissioners uh, and officers so that everybody understands what they're taking on when they become a LASA commissioner that does not currently exist. We suggested creating a characteristic skills and expertise matrix to really help the elected officials who are selecting commissioners um, to, to fill open seats in the most strategic and helpful way possible. So that skills and expertise matrix of needs would address diversity, um, inclusion and representation by people of color and people with lived expertise, but also have the kinds of skills and expertise that, that the LASA Commission needs in order to do its job well. So that when a, when a seat becomes open, um, you know, an elected official who's making a recommendation uh, or making an appointment can really understand who they're going to be looking for to fill that seat and what kinds of skills and expertise that person needs. We also recommended uh, working with uh, the LASA work with the mayor's office and the city council to develop a process for filling and confirming uh, seats that are identified by the city of Los Angeles in the future. Right now, um, there are seats that have termed out that or uh, the mayor has uh, people that have carried over. So uh, there's a little bit of um, disconnect between the city council's role um, and, and the mayor who actually identifies um, folks for the LASA commission seats and uh, working together with the mayor's office and the city council to actually develop a process and a schedule would be incredibly helpful to making sure that the city is cohesive in terms of who their representatives are on uh, the LASA commission. And then the last thing I wanted to note here um, is we recommended creating an ad, an ad hoc committee or other type of body on sub-regional planning so that um, sub-regional issues have a place to sit within the LASA Commission. Many of your partners uh, that were in the county, other cities, the COGS, identified this as, um, as a place that they would like to see an improvement really to, to understand how they are connected to the commission overall. This one is something that I think is incredibly important. And that is right now, there is no body. While we want all the bodies to be streamlined and we want to make sure that they have strategic purposes, uh, creating fewer bodies wasn't necessarily the purpose. The it was really about creating strategic um, uses for any body that is touching LASA's work. 
but also filling gaps. And what was very clear to me in my interviews and in my review of all of those documents was there is no body where key elected officials with jurisdiction over homelessness assistance resources um, can convene with LASA leadership and the LASA commission to do the kind of planning that needs to be done. And so one of the recommendations in my report is really to create what I was calling a bridge. I think that um, in my next recommendation, you'll see that there has to be this, again, um, regional planning body that's created. But while that's being created, can key elected officials get together and create um, a body that will help LASA be successful in its work? And uh, we need to quickly engage important decision makers um, so that urgent challenges that you all are seeing every day can be addressed and then really lay that groundwork for the regional and system level approach that we're suggesting. And that brings me to the third recommendation, the, thro the third broad recommendation that, that the report includes, which is to really support system administration and develop system-wide vision and goals by identifying um, a system level review and conducting an assessment of all public and private uh, governance structures that impact homelessness, identify a mechanism, a permanent mechanism to develop robust a robust system approach to ending homelessness in Los Angeles, and uh, shared goals and metrics to drive decision making in the county and uh, the city of Los Angeles. And then once that is developed, really reviewing LASA's legal authority to make sure that it can carry out the role that it has been identified to carry out. So with that, I'm gonna pause and, um, and see what kind of conversation or discussion we wanna have. And just note, um, Heidi, was there anything that I missed or that you wanted to cover? Nope, thank you, had it, thank you. <laughs> Members of the committee, uh, this is our opportunity to raise uh, questions or clarify um, what was in the presentation. Uh, should it be uh, deemed necessary or appropriate? Um, with your permission, um, I want to uh, begin by um, asking the, uh, the question uh, that's in some ways um, embedded in the uh, presentation, particularly the recommendations to try to do a diagnostic of what's really going on with loss of, um, can you more explicitly uh, as Believe, uh, um, get to the um, issue or concern, you can validate or dispute the, this impression uh, that uh, LASA may very well be one of the most uh, misunderstood or undervalued. Um, public entities uh, addressing the, uh, the crisis that we describe as homelessness. Um, when indexing the appointing authorities of governing bodies, uh, it's not uncommon, nor is it any secret that uh, the affirmation, the accolades, the attaboys, are few and far between. What do you think that's attributable, attributable to? Is that fair? Um, what's really going on with that? I want to hasten to make the remark that uh, um, I'm struck by it. And and trying to sort out over the next several hearings that we have, what's underneath that? 
and we give you an opportunity to offer your insights in that connection. So, you know, I, nothing but straight talk in this committee, ma'am. Outstanding. I do well with straight talk, so thank you. I think LASA has one of the most difficult jobs as an organization that works on the issue of homelessness um, in the country. And I say that as somebody who uh, was the lead funder for 400 different continuums of care across the nation. Um, and that, to me, that stems from, uh, because they have homeless services authority in their name, folks tend to think that all things related to homelessness sit within LASA's control and that they actually have the authority to do those, to do what they need to do. And I don't think either of those things is 100% uh, true. Um, so does LASA have an identity problem? No, LASA has, no, I don't think LASA has an identity problem. I think LASA doesn't actually have the full authority to do the work that they are responsible for doing. And I also think that there are many things outside of LASA's control, including inflow into homelessness and the creation of affordable housing that are so critical to um, ending homelessness, both in your own uh, region and nationwide, that uh, often those things are not put together in the public eye. So as you probably know, LASA has been uh, LASA and all of its all of its uh, subcontractors have been housing more people over the last couple of years per year than they ever have. But the problem is increasing. They are not causing the increase in homelessness. They are trying to address the increase in homelessness without the full authority to to do that work. I think it's reasonable to say, and I doubt that anyone would contradict your assertion that. LASA is not causing the uptick in homelessness. Mm -hmm. uh, that isn't the point, respectfully. The point sure. is, what is LASA's response to it? Is it an effective response? And uh, can it be, should it be counted on uh, to help address that? And if so, how well is it doing in that regard? You make an additional point, namely that LASA doesn't have the authority to do all that which is uh, to be done. Maybe you would unpack what that authority might look like and how such authority uh, might be delegated, assuming that it is uh, otherwise housed in other entities. And related to that, uh, I want to say that a part of the uh, complaint, part of the criticism, part of the critique is uh, that LASA on the one hand claims not to have the authority. On the other hand, uh, there's a sense that LASA is accountable to no one. How do you reconcile those uh, uh, somewhat disparate points of view? So to start at the, at the beginning of, um, of your statement, I, I think that the report itself and, and the presentation that I just did notes that there are places where LASA's operations do need to be improved and LASA is working on, on those items. Uh, as I mentioned- Chief among them would be what? Um, I would say contracting and payments came up most often um, in, in my interviews. Again, that creates, when that doesn't work the way that it's supposed to work, it creates some mistrust um, within the system that, that can be addressed by straightening out sort of procurement and, and payment schedules, make sure that people are paid on time to the extent that LASA has control over that. Sometimes they don't. Um, so starting there, I think, is the reason that uh, I had that three-step, uh, the slide with the, the three-step process. Operations right. has to get done first because you got to build um, trust in the organization and the system. Um, the, the second part of um, 
of your question is really about do they have the authority and if they don't what are other pieces that that they need to have i already pointed to they they don't control the systems that uh that people flow into homelessness from so your mainstream systems are really controlled by the the county and for the most part um and to some extent the city so we're talking about jails hospitals um behavioral health um other types of mainstream child welfare other types of mainstream systems that very often uh, exit people into homelessness um, so there's there's one piece that i'm not saying that they should control that but what i'm saying is that somebody should be ha should have an eye across all of these pieces including inflow and including um, affordable housing development which is the other piece that lasa does not control and then within the system uh, within the rehousing system there are pieces of authority that are delegated to LASA, and there are other types of authorities that are kept with by the city of Los Angeles or by the county um, that are kept in-house. So there is some disconnect there as well. And the way it showed up in my governance interviews was I take part in four different work groups all on the same subject. One is run by the city, one is run by the county, and one is run by the regional homelessness, like by the RAC. Um, so that's how it was. It became clear to me that there is a dis, there is a disconnect uh, between LASA and the city and the county that is actually not driven by LASA. It's driven by decisions that are being made uh, by their government partners. It actually sometimes puts LASA in the middle of a disagreement between the city and the county that they don't have the authority to try and rectify. All right, members of the com committee, I want to um, um, move to your questions and the like. I have uh, many more. Um, with your permission, let me just um, tee up uh, Mr. Buscaino's question. This is as follows. He states, I appreciate the report uh, as it recognizes the need to build a strong connection between the commission and elected officials. But I'm most concerned about the lack of coordination and, and connection among those with boots on the ground, namely outreach workers, city workers that regularly interact, interact with those uh, persons experiencing homelessness. For example, firefighters, police officers, sanitation workers, traffic officers, librarian, uh, rec and parks staff. That ends his quote. So the question that he poses, will or can LASA commit to sharing client level data with the city and its departments that regularly interact with the unhoused to the greatest extent allowable under of the law, and that may be a question that's better directed uh, to uh, Ms. Uh, Marston, uh, but I want to put it out there as one of the things that is of uh, concern. The second question was, does LASA have a system of tracking whether an individual has been offered a meaningful alternative, and will LASA commit to sharing this information with the city, the uh, more granular operational question uh, that uh, Ms. Marston uh, can answer at the right time. I wanted to uh, get those couple of questions on the table um, for the time being. And from there, let me proceed in the following order uh, with Ms. Uh, Rodriguez, Ms. Raman, and we will keep going there. Please proceed, ma'am. So should I go ahead, or do we want to allow them an opportunity to respond for Mr. Buscaino, or they're going to respond? I want you to proceed, and they can uh, kind of think about uh, Mr. Buscaino's question, and we'll get back to it. Thank you. Terrific. Well, Ms. Oliva, first, I want to say you were well deserving of those three glorious introductions. Okay, outstanding presentation. Thank you. You're out of order, Ms. Rodriguez. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say that. 
Um, but, uh, you know, I think you, you know, you've hit a lot of really important markers that we've seen. I think by design, it's, it's, it's by design to not function in an efficient manner. And there's layers upon layers of uh, corrective fixes, if you will, that have been placed on LASA that have only made it more complicated for us to get to the very root outcomes that we all desire. And I think, you know, that's a, that's a function of a lot of politicians, a lot of, uh, from a variety of uh, levels of government that have interceded in this work. And uh, everyone, you know, from varying perspectives, layering on all of these uh, pieces. And I know, and I, and I recognize that that has been most problematic with, I think, much of the conversation that we're having today. My question really is about, you know, we've seen substantial growth. And I think one of the areas that you've underscored is the substantial growth in financial resources that came as a part of, it basically grew LASA into becoming much more of a contract administrator uh, in, in large scale. Right. And listen, I'm, I'm not here to defend even the city of Los Angeles. Even the city of Los Angeles is terrible at paying its bills on time. So there's no room for everyone to be scowling at other people for being, uh, you know, uh, deficient in uh, in being really great contract administrators. Uh, the city of Los Angeles has not had its uh, greatest reputation on that side either. That said, when you do scale up those resources and then don't have greater levels of accountability amongst those providing the service, that's where we're finding, I think, our biggest source of frustration is that there are a lot of contracted entities, and I've, I've you know, communicated this many times with my own experience, among those that are contracted to do the outreach, we're still unable to derive the data and the substantive outcomes that reflect the amount of money that we're actually investing in these areas. And that, I think, has been the biggest problem. But that won't be achieved through greater uh, efficiencies in the contracting. It's about a governance structure that's missing. And so within the JPA, who would, where does the authority lie? And I don't know if you have that uh, information, but in terms of amending the JPA for us to uh, amend the governance structure in a manner that perhaps would derive greater outcomes for those levels of accountability, who would have that authority and what would be the process of doing so? So I am not an attorney, and I'm not going to try and interpret your um, joint powers agreement. Uh, John turned on his his yeah. camera, so he might have a thought, but I think that um, All right. do so likely has an answer to. Well, yeah. let, let let me uh, call on the, the chair of the um, ad hoc committee on Lasso's governance, namely. Uh, the inimitable Sarah Duso. But before doing so, I'm trying to see if John. Uh, Wickham is uh, attempting to practice law today, uh, and uh, where uh, Gita O'Neill is uh, going to weigh in here as well. So uh, whoever deems it appropriate to uh, respond to Ms. Rodriguez's uh, insightful question, do so. Uh, uh, Gita, you want to go after it? Uh, I think John can start. I think you had something to say, so I'll, you know, chime in as much as I can, because I'm not going to give legal advice clearly in the, in the committee meeting. But if John has an opinion, you know, absolutely, he's got a great background. All right, Mr. Wickham. Yes, sir. Um, the LASO was formed as a joint powers authority between the city and the county. It's basically a contract that is authorized under state law. So if the city and the county decide that they would like to amend the JPA in a way that would address whichever um, uh, changes you would like to uh, address, that would be negotiated between the two entities and agreed to by the two entities. And that would become the operation for LASA going forward. Mr. Chair, can I add something in order to answer Councilmember Rodriguez's question. You certainly may, Ms. DeSalt, proceed. Thank you. Um, it, but what I want to make clear in, in Anne's report is that the JPA over time is not the only um, document that's giving authority to what's going on here. Governance reform is about looking at who's doing what and who to whom are they accountable. And as Anne laid out, 
there are actually many governing boards of LASA, not just the commission, which is created and, and detailed in the JPA. There is a COC board. There is a CES, you know, the, the sorry, coordinated entry uh, council. So there are all these different entities. So Councilman Rodriguez, you may be asking about who is prioritized for housing. That's not within control of the commission and it's actually not a part of the JPA. And so it, there are certain things um, and that have over time evolved because we're also a COC. We have to follow HUD regulations. I mean, one of the rules that I see, you know, a lot of things that were put in place were really hurdles put in place by the federal government under Republican administrations to try to make sure we weren't serving anyone who was undocumented. And that really makes us do backflips around uh, documentation that shouldn't exist. And, and so there's things, I just wanna make sure that it's clear how complex this is. And I'm so grateful for this, for Anne's report and this conversation, cause it's gonna be going on for some time. It's not gonna, there's not really an easy answer. And I, I also look forward to John's uh, report because I know how much time and energy he put into it. Look, Councilwoman, to the other part of your point, when the city provides funding to LASA for services to be provided, um, we can, in our contract, provide details on what we expect to be the delivery for that uh, contract. And we, uh, somebody has asked me to point out that our, again, to reiterate, the CLA report will be presented at your next meeting in response to a motion um, approved by the council to, to evaluate this structure. And one of the issues that we do go into some detail on is contracting and the extreme, I mean, actually extreme importance from both an administrative operations standpoint of the contracting process, as well as from the governance structure of the contracting process. So what might actually seem like an administrative issue is actually, contracting is actually a significant governance issue as well. So we'll, we'll be able to discuss that in more detail um, at the next meeting. We look forward to your uh, presentation. Uh, for now, I think and we do not have to be exhaustive in our uh, attempt to answer this, uh, but it seems that um, uh, Ms. Uh, Dussault's intervention has provoked a range of questions that uh, point to the complexity of, uh, of this bureaucracy that we refer to as FASA, which uh, could in fact speak to um, why uh, accountability as it is being spoken to is so elusive. Um, um, uh, elusive is what I want uh, to say, and I, uh, uh, think that accountability has to be the order of the day. And if I am in any way to uh, get the impression that the very entities that um, are responsible for birthing LASA, who are signatories to the Joint Powers Authority, uh, have no uh, ability to um, substantially uh, reform overhaul, dissolve, uh, that points to a substantial set uh, of issues that we need to dig into with some care. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that for the time being, but uh, uh, thanks for uh, uh, provoking me, Ms. Dussault. Uh, we'll turn now to, uh, and for your questions, uh, Ms. Rodriguez, very helpful. Um, now for more, uh, candor, we turn to council member Nithya Rama. She's going to hold for a moment. Uh, we'll move to council member Kevin De Leon. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Ms. Um, Oliva. I, I want to thank you very much for, uh, I want to reiterate uh, Councilwoman Rodriguez's uh, comments with regards to uh, a very good presentation, uh, very thoughtful. 
a very insightful to have a better understanding of uh, uh, of uh, of this huge, you know, um, organization uh, we know is is, is Lhasa. But let, let me ask a couple of questions um, to get a, a little clarification uh, with regards to uh, authority um, and and like thereof. What authority exactly does Lhasa have currently? Because I think part of the narrative has been a little the, the confusion, right? Perhaps we assume that they have more authority and responsibilities than they actually do have. What what authority do they actually have? So that that's a, a little bit of a tough question to answer because it's not it's not um, always crystal clear. And here's what I mean by that. Um, Lhasa, in theory, has authority over the rehousing system, the, the rehousing part of, of the inflow, outflow, like home, lar larger homelessness system. However, um, because it takes money from the city and the county, uh, it is not always clear when that money comes through uh, what parts Lhasa has authority over and doesn't. So I think that, and, and Heidi or Sarah can give you much more detailed information about this, but, but let me just set up the conversation. Um, Project Room Key and how that has played out. LASA has uh, specific authorities within that program, but doesn't really have the authority to fully design it or to, to lease properties as far as I know. So there are pieces of it that were kept by the city or the county, but there are pieces of it that are delegated to LASA and um, it doesn't always make for a clear comprehensive approach by LASA as an organization. And I would invite Heidi or Sarah to just maybe like string out the details on that. Let me let me push on that just a little bit. Uh, are you uh, implying in any way that uh, perhaps LASA should have um, a more well-defined role in that process? Uh, would that be Helpful. I think that LASA's role should always be well defined uh, in whatever in whatever process uh, or whatever program or funding stream comes to it. Well, that's not sufficiently responsive. I want to know what your view is, if you have one, on that specific question. On the on the question of PRK. Yeah, in terms of you saying, as an example, LASA has no real authority in how that gets administered, moved, allocated, and the like. Um, and so I'm just asking, pursuant to uh, Mr. De Leon's question in terms of the extent of loss authority, sure. uh, I used the term elusive a moment ago, and uh, this may be an illustration I'm really trying to cause all of us to better understand what we're doing. So. I would say the, the public thinks that LASA has full control over um, over PRK and they and they do not. So I, I obviously am not I'm going to say like the thing that I would have said when I was working in government. I don't know what does why decisions were made or what the context was in those decisions. I did not dig into that. So I can't I can't opine on why the city made those decisions, but looking at it from the outside, what I can say is it would have made sense to me to give the whole thing to one organization, that being LASA, and let them run it. Got it. Mr. De Leon. So the question um, in, in, in Ms. Oliva, it's not a criticism of you. I know that you're doing this study and in, in, in the assessment, um, uh, it's it's a still a little confusing in what the authority uh, is with regards to to law. So what what they have authority to do, and, and I think perhaps with with the assessment that you've made, you've you've pointed out there's a lack of clarity and a lack of definition. And ultimately, I think your answer was to to the chair chair's question is whatever it is that they do is it should have clarity and, and definition as opposed to should they have authority over x y and z i think your answer is whatever it's like they do there should there should be clarity and, and definition so with with the the confusion and, and perhaps the conflation what 
authority do they they do not have so we'll go to the flip side what authority they do not have because you are right i think there's a lot of folks that um uh assume that they have much more responsibilities i i've, I've had conversations in the past week uh, with members of the state legislature as well as members of, of congress who have asked me the question with regards to lhasa um who uh are, are, are critical of nature um and, and i know that today or i don't know if it was yesterday one of the old members of, of this committee um uh, mr buscaino uh did a tweet that it's time for the city to withdraw um our our alliance or our resources uh, from lhasa so that's, that's a severe criticism and we're just trying to figure out on the flip side what responsibilities they do not have if you know which ones they don't have if please share so again it's not it's not that of a of a question to answer in this in this context but here's what i can say they very clearly do not have authority over inflow those systems exist outside of, of lhasa they do not have authority on affordable housing development that exists outside of lhasa in theory they do have authority over the rehousing part of the system but between the city and the county, not all of the functions related to that rehousing system are fully de delegated to LASA. And, um, and then they also have authority for the federal dollars um, and some of the state dollars. So, so again, there's, there's um, I think they seem to be fairly clear on the federal and, and the state dollars. It's really when funding, regional funding is coming together and uh, the, the full delegation is not done to LASA as an organization. As you know, the county keeps um, some of the functions related to homelessness within the county, uh, and some of that goes to, to LASA. And, um, you know, the, the city also sometimes does not uh, fully delegate some of the responsibilities that, that should go to LASA. And it feels like Sarah or Heidi want to in there. I, I just think it'd be helpful to give some concrete examples to the council member, I mean, council member de Leon. So for example, one of the things that council member Buscaino pointed out was the wait time. So say I've identified a place for a family. This is a real example. Um, and LASA in their rehousing role and case management role has said, oh, great, it's going to be in this place. We've got it all set up. Great. Now what we're going to do is wait months for documentation to be cleared through one of the PHAs or public housing authorities. Or maybe we're gonna wait months because they don't have a social security card and that's through the social security administration or it's through DPSS. Or we're gonna wait months for their income statement which would be coming from a different agency. Losses control is solely that they're working with the family, They've identified the unit, and now they're going to work with all these other agencies to try and get this family document ready, while this landlord is actually holding this vacant unit open in the anticipation that this family is going to come in. LASA does not have authority over that process, and many of those rules, as I explained earlier, were put in place by federal administrations to try and make sure that people um, without documentation, do not get any federal resources. Is this an opportunity, um, uh, Sarah, for engagement in our congressional delegation to uh, do some rule changes that make it much more efficient? Because from what I'm hearing from you, is you have a family in need, you have a, a, a roof ready to go, you've made all those arrangements. But now you have to uh, you have to sort of kind of surpass all these different hurdles that you need uh, to complete the, the final you know application process, the social security card, this documentation, that documentation, and that's sort of kind of out of your control, right? You don't control those entities or those bureaucracies or when they get to you and supply all that information, you know. So and hence that sort of that family maybe falls you know uh, through the cracks um, because those are things like 
like uh, they're out of your control because there's a sort of Byzantine um, federal system that sometimes can't get out of its own way and we need to make the necessary changes that would make it much more efficient uh, so we can get a roof over the head uh, sooner rather than later. I'm, I'm just suggesting maybe. I'm, yeah, I'm, no, there's, there's no question there's a lot of room for efficiencies, um, but it's, it, it's also the work you're doing right here today is super important. It's really getting, drilling down deep to have a shared set of facts to really analyze what is the optimal governance system and who's doing what, to whom are they accountable. And then within each of that, it's, you know, hey, can we waive this role? What about that role? I mean, that, that's that's been a cry from many of you for some time to try and waive as much bureaucracy as possible. Um, and there's just a lot more to do on that, pr on that front. No, thank you. Let me, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Heidi. If I could just add to, I think one way that I like to think about it, and John and I have talked about this, is soft power versus hard power. LASA has a lot of soft power in our ability to convene all of the different partners to try to build conversations and build a cohesive system and approach. But what becomes really important in Anne's recommendations is that aligned vision between city, county, loss, and others to say, here are the five goals that we have for our homelessness response system so that LASA can then say, okay, city and county have these five goals. This is what we need to, to address. But right now, everybody has different goals and approaches and rationales, which causes a lot of bifurcation, not only within LASA, but in the provider community in trying to meet all of the, the different demands in the right way. So I think the more that there can be alignment in where we're going and what we want to do, um, to have that collective impact, the better we'll be able to pivot ourselves directly to meet the needs of, of the elected officials. Um, and then, thank, I, you, thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. If Let's... I might just add one piece to that, um, the JPA is, uh, as as Commissioner Dusso mentioned, is only one of many different sort of ways that uh, LASA is. Um, have, has uh, accountability to other entities. The other way is really through the budget process and, and funding that comes from the city and county is often quite prescriptive. So it doesn't do what Heidi just suggested, which is give LASA an amount of money to get to, to be the subject matter experts and get the region to five goals that make up a regional vision. It, it actually is prescriptive and often not with what's coming from other uh, funding sources. And that makes it really hard to do contracts that's 100 pages long. Well, let me ask this question then, and I'm glad you actually brought that up with regards to um, the the governance board. And this is an open-ended question for for you, Ms. Oliva, and, 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 and Sarah and Heidi. Um, uh, on, on one end, if, if someone's coming to this you know, with a fresh, fresh eyes and a fresh approach, uh, without understanding the systems, and they look at your PowerPoint presentation. Um, I could see some folks could call for the dismantling of loss altogether, and saying perhaps it's 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 it's, it's deeply dysfunctional. Um, it, it just doesn't it doesn't the output and the outcomes for a close to a billion dollars a year. Other folks can say, okay, we have the recommendations here. What changes do we need to make to make it a stronger, you know, better organization that, that meets the needs of, of the crisis, you know, on our streets? Um, given the fact that LAFA was born from litigation, uh, suing the county and alleging that like, the county was not doing enough uh, to meet the needs of homeless community members. Uh, obviously, at that time, the governance board was, the governance of LA County was very, very different than than it has been in the past few years. With the Joint Powers Authority, with five city representatives and five county representatives, what is the role of the, 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 the governance structure of those appointments, the JPA folks? Because on one end, here's Heidi, you know, as the chief administrator, as the, the CEO or executive director, the, the operational person plus the staff, then you have the governance structure. What is the role of the five council members, or not the five council, but the five city and the five, you know, um, 
And to your point that a lot of the money, because $894 million, that's a lot of money. And that's close to a billion dollars. That's a billion dollars on an annual basis. Uh, you can do a lot of stuff with that money. And if it comes highly prescriptive from both the county as well as the city, and if staff believes, you know, we can be much more effective with less strings attached, and we can have to your point, the one, the two, the three, the five highest priorities that we want to really tack on focus. But what is the role of, of the of the governance folks and how come they've been so silent or maybe they haven't, you know, but they haven't been like engaged, like just like silent partners, if you will, you know, um, and sort of kind of there, but, you know, because Heidi's the face and Heidi gets, the accolades and highly it's a lot of the severe severe criticisms you know uh without question and the, the governance board you know where are they at and what is their role so i would note uh two items that i raised in in the report and in the presentation that i did today the first is uh you mentioned the lasa commission itself that's created through the jpa uh with the five and the five um, the, the, one of the recommendations that I made is that that commission actually needs to be, uh, that commission needs to, um, have job descriptions as well as have expectations and that elected officials should have some guidance on who can, who should be on that commission in order to fill certain, um, needs for Heidi as the executive should have a commission that is uh, that can help her move an agenda forward. And that just doesn't exist right now. And that was so that was one of the recommendations that was made so that our elected officials know what they're filling for and are filling uh, those seats strategically. The second thing that I would note um, as a recommendation is um, that really that creating that bridge and then in the long run, creating a formal body of elected officials that have jurisdiction over funding and policy with the city and county to really set that vision so that when their, their jurisdictions are providing funding to LASA, it's not short term. It is not so prescriptive that LASA can't actually uh, have the flexibility it needs to move its vision forward, the vision that they set. So I think that that's part of what's missing here. And it's what came across in a lot of the um, interviews was we don't know what we're aiming at up here. So LASA ends up being, I think, beholden to too many entities because everybody has their own strings attached, uh, if that makes sense. Can, can I make... add just All right. one point as a, a commissioner? Uh, um, in... uh, I'm going to uh, oh, want to um acknowledge the other committee members who wish to be heard at this point. Uh, uh, Ms. Raman, you are up next. Uh, Mr. So, uh, I don't know if your uh, intervention is urgent or if you can hold. Uh, uh, you have a clarifying point uh, for the committee's edification, Mr. So. No, we haven't heard from Council Member Raman. I'll, I'll wait. Okay, why don't, we, why don't we do this, if it's okay with you, Mr. Chair. I'll reserve uh, my questions and I'll come back around if you go. Uh, oh, no, we, absolutely. No, no, the, the, the point wasn't to... Uh, no, no, I, a little further. I just want to make sure everybody gets a shot of here. Okay. Okay, no. Thanks. So, okay, okay. Ms. Rahman. Yeah, I had, a, you know, I had a question about one of the challenges that we faced in working with uh, LASA to address the needs of people experiencing homelessness in our district. So one of the biggest challenges is that, you know, and some of the people who are currently unhoused have uh, issues related to mental illness or substance abuse that they need support with. Um, but that LASA ends up being our primary contact for kind of outreach and providing those services and getting individuals into housing or getting individuals into services. But LASA itself is not empowered to call upon DMH or call upon um, county departments related to substance abuse or really anything to aid them in moving individuals into services or assisting individuals with what, what they need. 
And so I was curious about with the recommendations that you provided, do any of those recommendations actually change that structural problem, which I think without which I feel like we're still going to be doing this the same, we're still going to be dealing with the same challenges, you know, unless we can really say to DMH, uh, you are our partner in this. Um, and that we are all working together to meet the needs of people who desperately need assistance. And to have a direct line of, I don't, I'm not even sure if I want authority over it, but just that we're all working together on it. And we know that we're working together on it right now for each individual. It's an ad hoc process that sometimes lots of employees in the field will call 211 to get DMH out there. And for places where there's a really severe need, I will pick up the phone and call leadership within DMH to try and get somebody to come. It cannot be reliant on these ad hoc methods in order to get people the help that they need. That's just not, that's not a system that works towards, uh, works to get us towards a common goal. And I was just curious about whether any of the recommendations that you offered, I know this was about loss of governance, but would any of those recommendations actually address that challenge, which I think is integral uh, to overcome in order to, you know, achieve our, uh, our broader goals of ending homelessness. Yeah, I, I think you put your finger right on one of the biggest challenges that was identified in, in, uh, in the interviews and in my own review. Um, and it's the reason that uh, the third recommendation, even though it doesn't have anything to do with loss of governance, um, per se, as an organization, uh, which was my scope, but the third recommendation about uh, developing system-wide vision and goals and developing that body that will um, ensure that uh, public sector systems have accountability at the table in the same way that LASA has accountability at the table is incredibly important. And so, you know, LASA, again, the, the step one around operations, very important. Step two, tighten up everything that you can within uh, LASA's purview, but that step three, Gets at your um, gets at your concern, and I think is foundational to making sure that this region can be successful. Councilwoman so uh, John Wickham with the CLA's office. Um, in in and we'll be discussing this more at our next meeting. Um, but again, what it turns out is the question isn't so much what is the loss of governance issue; it's what is the governance for the comprehensive homeless response system as a whole. Right, and that it, 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 when you start to think of it that way, th we have a multi-level governance structure operating in the region, and we need to find the right tools that align that multi-level governance and make sure that it is effective in providing the services where they need to be delivered and effectively and efficiently. And I've got another analogy for all of this, but we can we can get to that at another time. But this is really where the problem is, is finding the right tools to ensure alliance across the system. Just teasing us with your analogies, huh? <laughs> there you go. Any further involves, questions? Soccer. Waiting with bated breath. <laughs> it involves soccer. Yeah, okay, here we go. All right. Um, LAFC in the house. Okay, let's see if we can uh, move to any further questions from you, Ms. Rahman. Are we back to Ms. Rodriguez uh, or Mr. De Leon? Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think, yeah. you know, thank you, Ms. Rahman. I mean, I know that's also one of our biggest frustrations with the lack of DMH response. And I think that's true even with, you know, 11% of our population uh, that are living on house are also system discharge. So that could be emancipated youth, that could be, and so how do we align those systems to connect with you all so that they don't end up in the street? And that's part of the, that's one of our biggest areas to, as a stopgap measure that we could be implementing immediately. And that's within the county's jurisdiction completely. So, you know, that's an area where, you know, we could encourage our county partners to start working to align those. Uh, the Office of Reentry, for example, another big area for us to uh, identify. I know we have an Office of Reentry, but you know the same is true in the county and, frankly, in the state. Making sure that we're aligning all of those 
uh, you know, individuals in preparation to have the right housing, uh, rehousing opportunity available to them uh, is going to be important. But, you know, to go back to the concerns that were raised with respect to the documentation that is required as a result of the federally funded uh, housing, rehousing supply, you know, we've also invested most recently a substantial amount of locally sourced resources and state resources for housing opportunities. So what obstacles do we face with our own uh, documentation needs with respect to that? So I, I understand as it relates to Section 8, for example, and the federal sources, but we've invested a great deal of dollars here locally for our own, whether it's even with Bridge, if it's with PSH, um, you know, it doesn't, it should not come with the same strings attached. So what documentation obstacles do we have uh, comparatively to, you know, you know, notwithstanding obviously what the feds require, but, you know, our, do we have our own obstacles with our own documentation requirements with locally sourced resources? Uh, so I would say there, there are certainly doc, uh, requirements that get in the way, and it, it's not as much at the local level, but I would say it's involved at the state level, um, and a lot of it has to do with how this housing is funded through the tax credit system and others, and funders at the state level requiring documentation that permanent supportive housing developers want to meet those requirements before accepting folks into units. So this is why LASA created Housing Central Command, and we're happy to come back and share some of those findings. But in really breaking down the process, we've been able to work with, with those housing providers to say, what are the things that are getting in the way? And then going back to the state and saying, can you loosen these requirements because it's delaying our ability to move people in? We've been semi-successful in doing that, but there's a lot more work to do. And I actually think working with this committee and the council on continuing to apply that pressure at the state level will yield greater benefit at the local level in our ability to fill those units. All right. Satisfied with that response, uh, Ms. Rodriguez for now. Mr. De Leon. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, um, as well as colleagues. Um, I want to go back to uh, a dollar figure, the, the $894 million open-ended question to Heidi and, 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 and to, um, to Sarah and, and to Anne. Um, if you had your druthers and without the strings attached, from both city, from the feds, from, from the county. Uh, how would you use that close to a billion dollars? Would you use it the way you're using it now or would you use it in a very different way? So there would certainly be, there are core uh, components of our system that we know need to be ramped up. So like the rehousing work, we would strive to look at finding alignment because we need all of the pieces. We need prevention, outreach, shelter, and housing, but we need to right size that. So our approach would be to find the right ratio of all of those things. But I think what's important to note about the current budget, because it is at its highest it's ever been, the majority of the funding that LASA is putting out to providers right now is one-time money. Um, with the exception of things like Measure H, and it becomes very, very difficult for the system at large, nonprofit providers, LASA, to receive big amounts of money that have a timeline that we don't know that we're going to face a cliff in a year or two years without the promise of where things are going to go. So we spend a lot of time advocating at the state level in particular, but also the federal level to get some ongoing commitments, because if it's one time money, do we really want to house somebody if their subsidy is going to run out in a year? We don't know how we're going to help them pay for housing. So that's a big part of this system and the dynamics of it that really hampers the ability for, for long term outcomes. So it requires, I think, a much more robust response from those governmental entities that have huge surpluses right now. So we can sort of count on sort of it's going to sense in one year. That's all we have left for a subsidy. How long can we keep this going on? Five years, six years, seven years and for so forth. Yeah. How do we build programs? If we're at an 800 million dollar level right now, we're probably not going to be at that level next year. So how do we build sustainable programs and interventions for people with money that's going to go away? Um, and where is the money going to come to offset that? Councilman, uh, pending in the state legislature is AB 71, which the city currently supports, that would provide a permanent source of funding for homeless services in California. And that's a need that was identified by the Little Hoover Commission back in 1989. 
in the state of California still has not come to the point of addressing that. So AB 71 in particular would be a very important step forward on that. Do we know where that bill is at right now in committee? Is that on the assembly side? Um, yes, I, I can track that down and send that to you. Okay. Okay. It just got out of committee. It's got a committee. Mm -hmm. It's got a long life to go still. Long line to go. If it's going to come to fruition. Yeah. Sarah, were you going to say something or add? I was just going to add on the one time money. I mean, this is a huge opportunity for us also to um, create interventions that change the trajectory of people's lives, bringing it back to people. And the, the reality is, is that, um, you know, one thing that LASA does really well is some of the policy work that, um, whether it's the ad hoc report on black people experiencing homelessness or the uh, report on women. And most recently, we employed the California Policy Lab to examine the needs of people who are unsheltered. And looking at 2018 data, they found that there are 10,000 people in LA County who have um, been hospitalized, have a diagnosed um, severe mental illness, um, and are living unsheltered. So in addition to the figure that Councilmember Rodriguez gave of the 11% that are literally discharged into homelessness, we have 10,000 people. I don't know, I, my guess is that would be 6,000 in the city of LA, if it's commiserate with the other um, sort of divisions, who uh, have a, a need a significant um, medical intervention that honestly should be paid for by a mainstream system. That's not part of the rehousing system. And so as we're looking at these interventions, how, um, and, and to sort of double down on Anne's third recommendation, how are we coming up with a view that's eye level here to be able to look at um, getting, you know, mainstream systems to actually support people um, and not just prevent them from falling into homelessness, but pull them out of homelessness. I think to, to uh, Councilwoman uh, Nithya Ramins and, and also uh, Ms. Rodriguez's point with regards to DMH and, and, and Heidi and, and, and Sarah, if you have any thoughts or opinions, um, I, I, I can share an experience and, and I think, you know, I, I won't speak for Heidi. Heidi will speak for herself whether she wants to share or not. You know, we may have some shared experiences with regards to um, interventions with individuals um, who are, are severely mentally ill and having a psychotic, you know, episode and the county, uh, because the city of LA doesn't have a, a department of, of mental health, it's under the jurisdiction of, of, of the county, uh, but there was failure within the systems to, to intervene clearly. And we have normalized, um, we've normalized, you know, um, individuals who are severely mentally ill who are living on our streets every single day. And we just watch them, we see them, right? We see them walking down the street, you know, half naked or, or naked completely, or with a blanket, you know, over themselves, um, speaking loudly to themselves. Um, and we just kind of like, it's par for the course, you know, and um, uh, uh, if, and, and that's the county's responsibility and DMA, DMH's responsibility, but also there's a governance structure under DMH, you know, that makes either the policy decisions for DMH or votes on the monetary fiscal budget for DMH. What, what, what do you believe DMH has to do to improve their standing to deal with the large? And of course, this doesn't, this doesn't touch those individuals who are homeless because um, uh, economic reasons and just unfortunate bad luck. Uh, but those individuals who are part of a cohort of extreme mental illnesses, what does DMH have to do? Or maybe not nothing. What are your thoughts specifically and, and, and the governance structure of, of LA County? I think it's a really important point to mention because like you said we have some of these shared moments where we've seen people even in our positions having the connections that we have and reaching out to leadership to ask for support they have you know dmh has teams that respond to individuals in crisis but you know for the entire county they only have seven teams and we know that at any given minute there's more than seven individuals who need those types of resources so the alternative is for people to call 911 which starts a whole trail of 
you know, unfortunate events. So I, I think one, it's really scaling up the outreach response for those severely mentally ill, those people who are having psychotic issues. Sometimes they're housed, sometimes they're unhoused. And then on the other side, I think Sarah's point is building the infrastructure of like the long-term mental health support that people will need who might need a higher level of care than permanent supportive housing can provide. They might need a board in care or some other sort of institutional setting that just doesn't exist right now. So we're putting the burden of, you know, that work on a homeless response system that's already strained just from economic purposes. So looking differently at DMH and the way that we can build their infrastructure and then also coordinate better on the response would be a huge step forward um, in making sure we're actually moving the needle. So to, to your point of the original point that Sarah made with regards to building infrastructure, whether it's board and care, whether it's more beds, uh, psychiatric beds, um, that's a budgetary issue then. And that's an issue either A, the LA County Board of Supervisors make a decision if they reprioritize current dollars in their budget, or B, go to the state and ask them for an augmentation to build that infrastructure, or go to Washington, D.C., or go to the county of voters the way uh, 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 Council Member Mark Willie Thomas did with Proposition H and successfully passed before the voters the, 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 the increase of the sales tax to deal with these with these issues, you know, um, because there's a, if there's an infrastructure capacity issue, right? Um, and we're dealing with a, a, a specific cohort as opposed to a larger universe of un unhoused individuals. Um, so that is that is that is ultimately I would make the assumption, not John Sharon's decision, but the governance structure of LA County Board of Supervisors. Am I correct? I mean, I'd, I'd have to argue some of it is, some of it isn't. Some of it's yeah. not budgetary. On on board and cares. Um, you know, they, that's definitely a budgetary issue in terms of the daily rate, and that's been pushed forward at, at the state. And but the issue of boarding cares, we fought to have Home Key include funding boarding cares, and yet not a single boarding care was actually included in that package. So um, I do think part of the issue is this silo. I I live in both of these worlds because I am both an advocate around mental health because my brother is homeless and mentally ill and then I'm also an advocate around homelessness. So I can see how these two worlds are completely separated. I'll go to a mental health commission and they'll be talking about things that are completely divorced from the unhoused community um, because there's not a lot of overlap. So that, yes, it, some of it's a governance, some of it's above Dr. Sharon, some of it is not, you know, sometimes there is the money for this. It's how the money is prioritized. So it, it really does come down to this third recommendation that Anne is putting forth. So, um, so Sarah, so let me say this, and I'll finalize the questions. I know folks want to move on. So it is not necessarily a budgetary issue is what you're saying but it is an issue of priorities. Either you make it a priority or you don't make it a priority. And the end effect so far of the outcome that we're experiencing collectively as a city, as a county, as a society, is that it has not been made a priority. Not putting words in your mouth. Yeah, but it's just that it's, it's both that it has to be a priority and um, again, there are regulatory issues that are standing in the way of creating more subacute beds, period. There are regulatory issues that prevent us from using Medicare and Medi-Cal for things like housing that shouldn't be in the way. So uh, when I say it's not budgetary, I'm trying to make it clear that the governance issue plays into the ability to have that transparency to know what the roadblock is. Because um, the roadblock has many facets. Some of it's budgetary, some of it's priorities, some of it's regulatory. And when you bring up the issue with regards to regulatory roadblocks that doesn't allow for dollars perhaps to be fungible, to be utilized for X, Y, and Z, it, I think this is important because uh, when we sort of kind of unpack, uh, to use the word that our, our, our chair uh, used earlier, to, when we start unpacking, right, it's sort of kind of micro-analyzing these points, do, when we say we can't do this, we 
can't do that, do we kind of go, well, we can't do it because we have a regulatory roadblock instead of picking up the phone and saying, hey, you know, we have the largest congressional delegation in the United States of America, right? We have the largest legislative delegation in America. Do we say, hey, this is hampering us. This is a regulation that's antiquated. Uh, it's no longer germane to today, given the the growth of our unhoused population uh, is at record numbers. We need to make these modifications and these changes, and we need to do it now. Right or wrong or? Right. Okay. So I would suggest, because I think we need to do it ourselves too, is that, and, and I think Heidi was talking about it earlier, is you spend the time, you know, this is what someone like with Ann and say, what's every single roadblock imaginable that we face, you know, that is human made, you know, regulatory, what's statutory, you know, what needs to be changed, what needs to be modified. Um, and I'll give you an example, you know, very quickly. I, I created SB 1234, which is called Cal Savers Program. It provides uh, a, a, a financial product to every Californian who has no access to defined benefit or defined contribution at their place of employment. But it's not opt-in, it's opt-out, so it's automatic enrollment. However, because of the federal government and Congress, they had major roadblocks that either required a statutory change or a regulatory change. I could have threw up my arms and said, well, can't do it for California, but we made so many trips to Washington, D.C., dealing with DOL, uh, then Secretary Hilda Solis, then Secretary Tom Paris, and we made the regulatory changes through DOL and through the Treasury. And as a result now, California became the first state in the nation to provide a financial instrument, retirement security for those who have no access to EDC. The point I want to make is, is we got to sort of kind of figure it all out, right? And see what are all these major roadblocks? Because we know there's a lot, right? And I think there's a lot hip and stuff like that are well-intentioned, but now are the unintended consequences that prevents us from the ultimate outcome that we all desire, which is to try to put a roof and provide the wraparound services that are critical for the well-being of our unhoused community members. Mr. Chair, thank you very much, and thank you for your patience as well. Thank you very much, Mr. De Leon. Uh, Ms. Rahman, I see that your hand is elevated. Therefore, uh, you are now hereby recognized. Well, I, I just had a question for you, actually, as the chair of this committee. Um, and stemming from some of the questions that came up in in, um, in this report, what is the process through which we as a city council or we as a city start creating that, that um, governance structure uh, that can create a long-term political vision for this? Like, what is that? Does that happen here in this committee? How do we push it forward through here or, or, or how does that happen and what are the next steps to, because it feels like that is, we've talked about every level of government here, <laughs> every <laughs> level of government. So, so the, my question is really like, okay, let's do it. What's the next step? Um, you should stop uh, reading my notes here, uh, Ms. Rahman. That is not permissible in this committee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I was to uh, offer following in response to your uh, uh, rather uh, straightforward question. Yeah, let's do I, this. I think uh, <clears throat> uh, the plan, if there is a plan, is to really make sure that we've had a number of looks at what this governance structure is about by LASA itself honoring its work um, that it initiated well over a year ago uh, with its ad hoc uh, committee. We have to look at um, the city's work, uh, which we will do on May uh, 13th. The county has been at this as well to the extent that we uh, acknowledge them as a partner in uh, the creation and appointment process of LASA. We've got to hear what they have to say. And then there's a fourth piece of a more independent, you might say, uh, set of players uh, that have a view. After having done that, I would hope that the committee will be sufficiently informed, much more uh, uh, equipped, might I 
perhaps a, even more intelligent than we are now or when we began this journey to figure out what the path forward ought to be. <clears throat> I'm trying to carefully listen to the readiness for change, for reform, reform. I'm trying to carefully listen to whether there is going to be the uh, traditional and maybe anticipated roadblocks that are erected um, that say to us that um, uh, this can't be easily made better. And frankly, it's Robin, Mark Robin, it will not be said in that kind of language, but the bottom line will cause one to include that. I'm prepared to reject that point of view out of hand. And we need to press our way through this. We have a crisis <clears throat> on our hands. And um, Lhasa is in the middle of it. Um, and either it's helping us address or it isn't. And if it isn't, the question is, what do we do about it? If it is, what can we do to make it better uh, to enhance uh, active effectiveness that gives us an opportunity to lean in in ways that are increasingly uh, required. So um, a lot's going on. Uh, I pose a couple of uh, questions uh, that go to uh, both uh, Ms. Marston and uh, Mr. Salt, as it uh, or so rather, um, as relates to their notions of the next steps with this uh, report done by Ms. Oliva, uh, and especially in relation to bridge building and embarking on a system level review and goal setting. I mean, when does that take off? What 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 do you propose in terms of that timeline, in terms of um, specific operational improvements? Um, it seems to me that there has to be some discussion about, all right, we have the report. Uh, when do we be begin to move and in what direction we move? I pose the question also, um, the order that Judge Carter issued, to what extent is Lhasa's work affected by the order, um, if at all? Has it been adequately thought through? Is there more work to be done uh, in that connection? Uh, so um, Ms. Dassault and Ms. Um, Marston, what say ye? From the, the recommendations that, that Ann put forward internally at LASA, we, are, we aren't waiting to make the recommended changes. Uh, and in fact, the work was underway before and this reinforced that this needed to happen. So the work really right now is focused on totally modernizing our contracting process, making it easier for people to come in as new providers, but also making it easier to get contracts out the door. We've already started that modernization. Um, it's gonna move us also in a, and I think Councilwoman Rodriguez has brought this up before around uh, active contract management and accountability of our contracts. So now we're getting our systems in place that will look at the money, the contracts, and the performance all at the same time. So we can say, we gave you this much money. You've only done this much with it. We actually need to take some money now and put it over here so we can put all of our resources to their highest and best use in a way that we didn't have visibility into before. So all of that work has started. We are working with our lived expertise advisory board to totally modernize their process, to let them build the governance structure that they want to create and to build intentional connections with our leadership teams and our policy making so that they're informing the process and the work. Um, and those are just a few of the examples that we're carrying forward to make sure that we're being responsive on the things that we do control 100% um, and making sure that operationally we're functionally functioning as efficiently as possible. Uh, the question I would ask in addition to that is one that um, a number of members of the committee have um, members of the committee have 
proposed, namely, um, to what extent um, does Lhasa see itself being accountable to its appointing authorities, namely the city and the county of Los Angeles? And if it does see itself being accountable to those entities, um, how then does it happen that those entities weigh in on these uh, improvements? Uh, uh, what buy-in is there to uh, cause a higher comfort and or confidence level uh, on the part of those respective bodies who are signatories to the Joint Powers Authority, although we've learned here that there's a multiplicity of entities operating in the context of, of, uh, of LASA. So anyone who has any uh, ideas that they're contemplating that uh, uh, they're going to take LASA down easily, they better put their overalls on. We heard you, Sarah. Uh, at any point here, uh, I'm just trying to understand what it is. Uh, how do you spell accountability? Uh, how do you? Yes. Well, for, for myself, uh, I, I say all the time, I have 31 bosses. It's the city council. It's the mayor. It's my commissioners. It's the board of supervisors. And so my goal is to make sure that we're doing everything we can to be responsive to the needs of the funders and the desires of the funders. And as we're building our internal operational improvements, that it's responsive to concerns that we're hearing from those funders that come and they're, they're widespread. But to Anne's point, there really are themes that emerge very quickly as you're talking to these folks. And so it gives us our roadmap to say, these are the important things, not only to get the money out the door as quickly as possible, but to be responsive to what people are seeing and hearing in those experiences. And it gives us the tools to come back with more transparency to say, hey, here's our provider dashboard. And now you can actually see how providers in your area are performing relative to the goals that we've set forward. And I think that's been a missing piece with LASA for a long time is that there hasn't been the transparency into the system and the work being done. Uh, and we want to be better and continue to build on that work to show everybody how things are doing, where we need to improve, where we need to pivot, uh, and continue to move us forward in the same direction. Um, and you uh, earlier made the point that you have consulted, viewed, studied several hundred such entities. Um, but I think I concluded from those remarks that never have you seen anything like this. Did I read you correctly? Yes, uh, I, I think that um, this community... Uh, uh, just a little louder, please. Sorry, I said yes. Uh, this community has more complexities, uh, a larger region. You have, we haven't even talked about the number of other cities that are within the county jurisdiction um, and the number of, uh, of entities that touch homelessness is, is incredibly complex. The next probably most complicated place that I've worked is King County, Washington, and um, and the challenges uh, and the numbers of people that are experiencing homelessness in Los Angeles are, are much bigger yeah. um, than King County. Right. Yeah, we've, uh, they have sought to uh, consult with us, particularly around Measure H, the mm -hmm. left holding their head uh, tightly as a result of what they observe here. Uh, I also just want to say, I don't want to just say that LA has so many challenges and, and make you think that I don't think they're solvable. I think they're solvable. Um, I, think that, I think that this process in particular needs, needs a champion or champions to help make it happen. But these feel like the governance issues that that I was asked to take a look at feel solvable to me, and um, and I think will make your system stronger in the long run if everybody is rowing in the same clear direction, and um, and LASA has the authority and flexibility that they need to to carry out their work. 
appreciate that. Um, and so I want to ask you about Andorra. Mr. Morrison, I want to ask you about the issue of uh, the court order. And I also finally want to ask you about SB 679. Is it, if it in any way impacts process work, or is that an effort that is complementary or could redefine the work of LASA in any uh, manner? Mr. So. Um, you know, uh, in terms of the court order, that's uh, that's not yet in effect. I mean, I don't know. Um, I, it sounds like the county's going to appeal. I don't know what the city is going to decide to do. Um, the the question that it's raising, um, I mean, I I really have a lot of faith and hope in all of you. I agree with Anne that these problems are solvable, and I would much prefer that we continue to work together to have um, plans put in place, whether it's the, you know, right to housing or, um, or working on, you know, adding thousands of units. I think it's really important that uh, the policymakers have that flexibility to get those policies put into place. Um, I want to put forth a, you know, what is the optimal system? And what I hear is, and what I want is something that's both hyper-local that I can help, you know, a, a woman that I run to into on the street, but I can also know that the regional needs are being met, um, and you know, our our medical beds, our beds for mental health, our beds for substance use, are actually being create, created and are part of a working system. I believe that's doable. I think we can figure this out, um, and I think we can break through this, you know, brick wall uh, together. I really do. Um, and, it, and in terms of next steps, you know, I, I'm, you know, we're waiting with anticipation for John's report because I think that's going to be really important for this body. Um, he's put a lot of work into it. And then I think that the work on operations is already starting, but that has to continue and that has to be accountable to this body. And, you know, and, and we have to keep that as an iterative process. But the work on the governance piece you know, I, I just appreciate today's in-depth conversation. I think you're going to have another one. Um, there's also third parties, uh, one of which I'm a part of um, through the Committee for Greater LA, that are going to be coming in to say, hey, let's look at, you know, uh, macro this way. So I think there's going to be a lot more um, information over the next couple of weeks that will provide the foundation for this body to make a decision um, on those issues. All right. Uh, uh, thanks very much. Um, uh, any insights in terms of anticipated impacts on LASA pursuant to the court order, uh, Ms. Marston? Uh, uh, Ms. Deso decides not to tangle with uh, Judge Carter. Uh, we understand. Um, but I, I read that order, order and it says this committee within 30 days uh, should do X, Y, and Z, otherwise get its act together. So I'm, I'm, elicit, I'm soliciting some help here. Um, yeah, moving, moving that forward uh, without a doubt would require a big shift in where we're currently putting resources and focusing them in that area. I think to your point, the coordination and the planning as soon as possible with LASA, with the city and with our providers is critical. I was on a call late last night with our the EDs of our provider agencies talking about what we could do. So we're, we're ready for direction um, because it's gonna be a big shift. And of course, there's gonna need to be a conversation about the resources and the how and the interventions to make that come to fruition. But we wanna partner with you in, in fulfilling what needs to be fulfilled. So it is the case that you're seeking direction and from whom you seek that direction goes to the very issue of accountability, which we've been trying to uh, peel back throughout this conversation. Um, it is interesting that you make the point uh, that Alasa will not be held harmless if the court order were to go into effect. Uh, it is in 
consequential, and I think we need to be cognizant of that in terms of the expectations that the respective stakeholders then have vis-a-vis -vis Lhasa. I think this is really rather important. I did ask a question about SB 679. Um, uh, any appetite to respond to that? Because that's a piece that's moved forward. Um, Ms. Marston, uh, any views on the matter? LASA itself hasn't taken a position. I would just say that, that anything that we look to do from the state level that would add another layer of an agency that would oversee housing or affordable housing and development would need to be done very intentionally. I mean, but today's conversation with all of the players who have stakes in this, adding another one, um, we would just need to make sure we're very thoughtful about how that happens and how that gets integrated without diverting attention or diverting focus from the work that we're trying to do. Uh, point made, uh, Ms. Marston, and ably so. Um, all right, members of the committee, uh, the clock strikes uh, 12.37. And I think uh, our presenters have answered our questions to the best of their ability. They have aided in our having a greater a sense of uh, the issues before us in terms of complexity on the one hand and uh, tend to uh, move forward in the areas in which there can be uh, progress. Fine. I think we should now uh, proceed uh, to adjournment, understanding that this uh, matter, item number seven, will be held in committee pursuant to the presentation by the chief legislative analyst. Our next regularly scheduled meeting will be 10 a.m. on Thursday, May 1 3. Uh, am I in order, Madam Clerk? Sorry, Mr. Mr. Chair, um, the next meeting of the committee is May 13th, sir. Yes. yes. Uh, and to the um, extent that there's no more business to be held this time, is the file clear? Madam? Sir, the desk is clear. And that in mind, we will uh, proceed uh, with this matter be taken up again uh, with the CLA's presentation on Thursday, May 1 3. Mr. Chair, yes, sir. Mr. Chair, the, next, at the next meeting, the CLA presentation, presumably from uh, Mr. Wickham of John, uh, what's it going to be on? On the same subject of governance. In other words, oh, okay. the governance with regards to Yes. In other words, the CLA has written a report pursuant to council motion and instruction on this very same uh, subject. So um, again, we, we're, we're hearing from Lhasa first, we'll hear from uh, the city that is a CLA second. The county has a report as well that we, we will have after. And uh, then there is a fourth report on this. So we're just gonna keep marching through this so that we are pretty muscle bound in terms of our understanding of what's going on as different analyses that are applicable. Okay. All right. Questions to clarify the matter. No, 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 all right. Thank you. With that, we thank you all for your participation and we now stand adjourned.